What's up everyone? Hey. Kevin from Epic Gardening here. <laughs> I'm here with Zach from Prema Farms. That's right. Yeah? Yeah. So we're up in Reno where we're actually, where are we? We're a little bit outside of Reno. Yeah, about, about 12 miles north of Reno, about 1,000 feet higher, about 5,260 feet is where we stand. Yeah, and so we're in zone, I believe, 5A. That's right. 5A high desert. High desert, yeah. And we're doing market gardening, organic no-till, <laughs> 1.5 acres. Pretty successful yeah, yeah. in your first couple of years. So I'm gonna hop behind the camera. Let's act be the star of the show. And I just wanna show you guys what's possible in a, in a small scale agriculture in a harder climate than many of the, uh, the other videos that I've done. You've seen me do videos with Steven and, and other farms, urban farms in New York, rooftop farms, but this is a special climate and uh, we got a special farmer. So Aww. I'm interested to, to see what's going on and, and I hope you guys enjoy the video. So we're in the germination greenhouse, right? Where all the seeds are started. We've got this really cool germ chamber here. We've got charts all over the place. And I think a lot of things that people don't think about in small scale farming is the level of like systemization that you have to go through. Yeah. And it, it looks really cool and it looks very planty and, and nature based, but there's a lot of like raw business intelligence that's behind this as well. <laughs> um, so I'm hopping behind the camera. I'm gonna kind of let Zach just talk you through what's going on in this section. You'll see about 40 varieties of vegetables in here right now. I mean, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty sweet. We do about 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 70% of the crops that roll through here are in paper pot trays. Um, paper pots, if you're not familiar with them, they're predetermined spacing, and it looks kind of like this honeycomb. And uh, and what you'll see in that is that you get an opportunity to put two or three seeds in per tray, which you'll see in this spinach. And then these webs, essentially, they fold all the way out, and this is two-inch spacing. And so when we put that right into the field. It allows these crops to thrive at the right spacing. So we'll do chard at four inches or our beets at six inches. And they feed through a paper pot transplanter one by one. Uh, each one of these little crops or cells gets uh, gets transplanted into the field. And, and before that, before you had the paper pot, what, what did your labor look like? What was life like before <laughs> the paper pot? Uh, was, you know, I think we started like everybody else did. And I, I think generations to come will never have that level of gratitude that we have towards just, you know, purely mechanical transplanters like the paper pot system. But but we, uh, we used to hand transplant every single seed. Yeah. And there's some cool tools out there that, that make you know hand transplanting faster, like the dibblers and the uh, uh, the gritter you know, from Neversync. But we, um, we, we tend to hand transplant every single thing. So we just mark a bed with a rake and then cross thatch it and then put seeds into every cell. And you know, it would take us three hours or maybe, maybe two hours to hand transplant a thousand heads of lettuce into a hundred foot bed. And, and now we look at you know eight minutes or ten minutes. Yeah. And so on that, on our scale, about an acre and a half, the paper pot transplanter from the gravity seeder all the way forward to the transplant saves us like may, maybe sixty hours, forty hours every single week on farm. And so we, uh, yeah, our base wage is fifteen bucks an hour, so it's about nine hundred dollars a week. Mm. Uh, that that is an investment for us is about you know it pays for itself in four weeks. Yeah, yeah. Even if it was twice as expensive as it was, it'd still be a perfect investment, right? Oh yeah, for yeah, a, yeah for a single season, right? Yeah, I mean, it'd make yeah. all the difference in the world. So that's it, it's something that, that we rely on heavily on our scale right now. Awesome. Um, so back here behind us, we we run these little Netafim uh, sprinklers. Uh, these are the green tips. Um, these are pressure regulators on there. Pretty pretty radical. They they stop all the drip from happening. So a lot of times, if you're just running an overhead setup or a mister setup, they're going to drip continuously on the plants below them. But these little pressure regulators stop that. They burst open. Uh, they irrigate this house, and you know it takes four minutes a day when the house sits at about 85 degrees, maybe five minutes a day in total irrigation to keep all of the seedlings in here wet. So do you hand water at all, or do you just use this as, as your main watering system? Yeah, yeah, so I hit the corners with a, uh, just with a wand, yeah. you know? So I'll come through in the morning and make sure that the corners stay wet, um, especially when this house is packed. Right now, because we're in peak season, it's pretty much, you know, harvest out, turn over, plant, every bed on the farm. Um, and so, it, you know, every, every this house will build up and stack up early in the season mm -hmm. you know, while there's not a lot of availability. But right now, since everything outside is flying, we pretty much take it out of here and throw it right outside. Got it. Yeah. Cool. So what kind of stuff you got going on? You said you're growing like 50 varieties and you think you might be a little crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I, I, it makes you feel crazy if I'm not crazy anyway, but I, I um, Yeah, we grow, we grow 50 varieties of vegetables. Right now, you'll see things from, yeah, you got zinnias, some of the later cut flowers that we'll be putting in. You got peppers back there. Um, some mint that we uh, that we'll be putting in back there at the end. You've got Salanova head lettuce that we do for either head lettuce or our spring mix. Um, kohlrabi for fall, mm. and then you got some of your uh, celery here and late, later herbs too. So we just, I mean, we're at what July fifth, 
And so we're just gonna start planting some of our fall successions. Mm. Um, up here at our altitude, I mean, we pull our tomatoes in August so that that way we have a winter succession, yeah. um, which is a huge deal. You yeah. know, like it takes a lot of maturity on our part to start a seed in January, let it go from you know June, July, August, pull it to get lettuce in to make sure that we can satisfy our customer customer needs through the winter time. Yeah, and your season is what 110 days you said. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. you gotta be like the systems have to be on lockdown because you have the the clock's ticking from day one. It is. Yeah. I mean, you know, we we do everything we can to hit the corners right. You know, and and like I said, we start planting in January. Um, we rely heavily on the houses early in the season yeah and then and then you know when when the outdoor beds open up and we could start to when, and the ground is thawed and we can start to plant outdoors we hit it with everything we have yeah because the season's over before we know it cool so, cool yeah. and so then what we got going on right here in this little mystery box so this is a phytotronics germ chamber it controls humidity and temperature um, it's got little extractor fans in it they draw the, the heat out when it gets too hot and then it's got a little bubbler down at the bottom that heats the water up and gets the humidity going. Uh, uh, almost and it like allows, a little mini sauna. That's exactly it for the yeah. plants. So it, it, it's got a temperature spectrum I think of 4 degrees so it rides usually between between 72 and 68 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, what you get to see are things like this like middle of summer salanova germination you get yeah i mean like almost a hundred percent right yeah that's, that's unheard yeah. of you know it's 95 degrees out at nighttime we have a huge diurnal shift here and these seeds would just panic but and talk to me about the price of that seed that's there's a seed that you <laughs> there's a seed you want to do 100 percent germ on it's probably salanova right that's it so you know if you're not buying it by the by the case it's going to cost you 50 cents a seed yeah um if you pick it up in large enough quantities you can get it down so it's reasonable but yeah it's a it's an expensive expensive seed you get like the Corinto cucumbers and some of the stuff that we do, the greenhouse cucumber varieties, the tomato varieties, you know, 75 cents a seed, 50 cents a seed. Yeah. And you're doing, you know, uh, 600 of those or 500 at a time. You gotta get it right. <laughs> you yeah. better, yeah, you better. Yeah. And, and this is the, yeah, this is a spot to dial it in. If you're using that paper pot system, man, I mean, if you if your germination is 10% off, I mean, that's 10% before you get to the field. Yeah, it, yeah. It just doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, guys, it's, it's so interesting always when I come to a farm because as a home gardener, if I have some germ loss, first of all, I'm not. It's not my livelihood. Number one. Yeah. And then number two, oh well. Like it, maybe I just won't have as many tomatoes. You know what I mean? <laughs> but for you, it's like I'm not going to make money, and my customers are, aren't going to be happy, which carries through into the rest of the business. And if you have germ that's maybe this low right here, like you said, there's other things that will cause the plant to die. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. So, so. What, what we see is like you know a lot of our promise because we're a newer farm in our market as yeah. well, and we're going up against huge California farms. So we'll make a commitment or a promise to say like, hey, I'll have cucumbers for you in June because I know you're gapping in your market. Yeah. And so a market will let us in. Mm. And if we can't come through with that promise. Yeah, they're like, because, we're done. We're done with you. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because yeah. then we're just doubling up on what everybody else is already producing right over the border in California. Probably for so. like a better price and all that stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bigger farm. Cool. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, that was the germ zone. We're going to head out to the field now. You get to really, really get to see that diversity allows us like a, just a, a niche because we can come at the market with pretty much anything that they need. You know, we'll say, hey, we've got leeks or we've got we've got onions, we have garlic, you know, we've got scallions, we have cilantro, we have, a, you know, a whole cut selection of herbs or, or bunched roots. You see like carrot successions coming on. We do chard. So the diversity for us is, is you know, it, it's a, I think it's just a reflection of how powerful a small farm can be. And like, yep, yep. Because you don't have to monocrop. You no. Can, you can survive without it. Yeah, and I can, I mean, if I get it, like we, we got our frost up to June 8th this year and you know typically it ends in the, in the end of May yeah but but yeah getting a frost that late like you're I, I could just continue to plant more successions of direct seeded radishes and turnips and just work with the weather yeah. as it fluctuates because it's been I mean for most folks it, like that I follow it's been more unpredictable than ever this year has been really weird yeah just even as a home gardener like my I'm in San Diego so my zone is 10b and I had the wettest spring I've ever had yeah yeah and June we had four sunny days yeah, yeah it was just a weird year and I think everyone's seeing it like globally yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so we get I mean a hundred a hundred and ninety percent of our annual precipitation came 
came in uh, January and February. This year? This year. So you got right? twice as much as last year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, so it's, it's, it really is like the ability of a small scale farmer to, to diversify like this, it just allows you to make decisions, you know, like, like uh, on the cuff. And yeah. so we can plant accordingly, you know, so what if I lose something in the prop house, if I don't get into the field and then take all that time because the weather stays cold, it's, it, it allows me to plant something else that could sustain that weather pattern, you yeah. know? Yeah. And so we make decisions like that all the time up here, you know? Um, yeah, just, just, yeah, we, we, we either wait or hold off or we go quick um, and get things in when we get a splash of good weather. Like these carrots we put in, in on March 15th, um, we do four row carrots and a four row cedar a lot from uh, Connor Cripmore's model. I mean, we, we primarily follow, he's like a huge yeah. inspiration for the farm. Yeah, for those who don't know who, who Neversink is, can you talk a little bit about your bed setup and why you do it the way you do it? You don't till? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's, I mean, it seems like it's remarkably slow to do a no-till agriculture, you know, and I think yeah. that that's like, people are like, yeah, it's really labor intensive. There's no way that you can make money doing it. And, and our model really is inspired primarily by, by Connor Crickmore and Neversink Farms. And he does an acre and a half no-till weed-free farm, yep. um, which, you know, is inclusive of running 15 or, you know, like five full-time staff uh, on the farm, working eight hour days, five days a week, you know, a really, really nice structure. Yeah. Permanent ra or permanent bed system, not raised beds, planting directly into the ground. Um, and, and, you know, one thing that he follows that comes from Elliot Coleman is using that four row cedar exclusively. Mm -hmm. and, and we use the Jang cedar a little bit, but the four row cedar is a cedar that allows us to get almost a thousand bunches of carrots on a hundred foot bed. Um, and that's what we're looking at here. Yeah, yeah, totally. So one, two, three, four, down a hundred feet. That's it. And what yeah. you'll notice is that everything here, super, super tight, yeah. right? And yeah. then a lot of space for us to get between and just run weeders. And so, you know, we run the hula hose through here. Um, so you it, can just walk it down the line. That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. And so we're not, you know, we're not allowing the weeds to get get ahead of a lot of these crops in the farm. We leave enough space to weed, but then these things are so tightly spaced that the carrots just come up and they go like this in the bed. They never choke themselves out and they still get to full size. Yeah. So it satisfies our market. You know, when we were doing the well, the Jang cedar and the mechanical uh, precision cedars, we could never get beyond 250 or 300 bunches of carrots on a hundred foot bed. And you're, you said you're pulling a thousand. That's right. So that's a four, three, at least a three X increase, if exactly. not four, yeah. which for, I mean, Again, like thinking from from the farmer's perspective and not the gardener's perspective, that's money in oh, the bank. It lets you sustain everything that you're doing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. I mean, yeah. yeah, so having an increase like that on a crop, you know, that has such great potential and that like really gets you into a great place with this altitude, the flavor and the carrots. Oh, a it's got to be crazy. Shift. Super sweet. That's yeah. it. Yeah. So it's, it's a great it's a great attraction for people as they walk by your booth to know that, you know, you're pulling carrots. And this is, like I said, July 4th, July 5th. We'll be pulling these carrots in the next week and just, you know, flushing a thousand, a thousand bunches uh, a, a week for the next 10 weeks off of these beds, which is pretty, pretty strong for us. Yeah. 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 yeah no kidding, man. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, like what you get to see back here is, is, is just a reflection of our bed systems. 50 feet, if you could imagine running a, a, like a BCS tractor over this and then trying to turn it around halfway and then run it back, it's inefficient. And so. Um, No-till systems for us, what they allow us to do is to plant a 50-foot section. We simply straddle the bed, um, run a four-inch hula hoe, and then we clean up the beds with the four-inch hula hoe, mm. get all of the matter out of it. Um, there's actually somebody going to be doing that next. Maybe we could show it. Sure. And, uh, and, and then, you know, the whole bed turns over, and it's a matter of 45 minutes to get a bed tilt to with a small tiller yeah. and, and, and then replanted, you know. So we, we don't ever so let the, the beds turnover the is is insane. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah Which is yeah. key again on a small farm, you got to find your efficiencies where you can because you're not monocropping a potato on 700,000 acres, right? It's, you got to yeah. find efficiency where you can. Yeah, that's it. And so I, we're hyper efficient, you know, yeah. we run, we run a lot of Elliott Coleman's tools. We do like greens harvesters, the four row cedars, yeah. Elliott Coleman tool. Um, and yeah, we work, we work a lot with that stuff, but it's, I think the, the idea behind that was that, oh, it's, it's slow, it's, it's prehistoric, and I, I, I'd say that it's the exact opposite. It's hyper-efficient, mm. it makes things happen really, really, really quickly, and it allows us to be hyper-productive. I was reading um, How to Grow More Vegetables by John Jevons, and he had a line in there that said, we still have yet to design a machine more efficient than the human body. No question. And and it seems like you kind of are, are living that right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's nothing like coming out and doing work like this with your body. Um, the way that you sleep at night, you know, you're not sitting in a tractor or pushing along tractor breathing in gas fumes. You do most of this labor by hand and like 
the reward that you take from that I don't think that you could ever quantify. Right, it's not a monetary reward. <laughs> which, I mean, we could talk about the money, but there's much more than that in the lifestyle of, of running a farm yeah. similar to this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's like, you just, you, you feel like you're so purposeful and you feel so full. Yeah. You feel like you're actually intrinsically a part of nature that way. Yeah. And you're not like apologizing to the land every time you run that tractor over <laughs> it, you disc it, you till it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're running Yeah, you're sucking it dry <laughs> instead of, uh, yeah, building it up like you guys are doing. Yeah, that's it. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah, so on that level, like thinking about regenerative ag or, you know, because that's like kind of the next, the next big word, I think, in agriculture. It's coming up. Yeah, yeah. people are getting away from, or, you know, just certified organic because that's, that's been infiltrated by, by a lot of, uh, you know, big corporate interests. Yeah, yeah, stuff, it's a certified you know? term now and it, it doesn't mean what it is supposed to mean. That's it, yeah. yeah. So for us, it's really the floor. We are certified organic to like get our foot in the door with that and show folks, but, um, you know, that, that we are, you know, not spraying herbicides and pesticides and using toxic chemicals on the farm that, yeah. that they eat. Yeah. But, you know, that, that, that really is just the beginning. Like we, we run four soil tests on the farm every season um, through each bed. And ju just to continue to say like, are we actually regenerative? Are we making the soil better than what we found it? Are we leaving this earth better than the, the way that we found it? And, mm -hmm. You know, I have, I have two daughters and my goal is that they can come out here and work through this land and this, they'll find this land to be better mm. than, than when we found it. It's a big deal. Yeah, yeah it is. So Aaron, if you want to show them real quick just what that looks like for a bed turnover, we, we tend to rope it off, we straddle the bed and then we just run the four inch hula hoe over the top um, and that removes all the sediment. And so let's say that there was, you know, some steady roots in there or anything like that, that green waste would all be eradicated. Um, you'd sever the roots and then we just go back through with a five gallon bucket. We pull it up and then we put it right into the right into a five gallon bucket into the compost. Yep, yep. It allows us to separate rocks too. So we put all the rocks into the pathways, anything that kind of deter our carrot growth. So like or, month over month, bed over bed, turnover, you're de-rocking your beds just longevity wise over time. That's it. Yeah, yeah. 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 So we're not there yet as 100 percent, you know, rock free, but yeah, it's um, it's just it's it's, it's a perfect setup for our scale. Mm. And he's you know he's only in an inch right now. He's just turning over the top inch. Then we put a uh, then we put you know a hundred a hundred pounds of compost onto that bed, um, and tilt it back in, replant it. Yeah. And these beds will live three or four lives in the season. So wow. It's, it's pretty and you're radical. getting your compost. You said about 10% on site. 90% is coming from a pretty interesting source. Yeah. 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 So yeah. there's a local prison um, in in Carson City. It's about I guess about 60 miles, maybe less, 50 mm. miles from here. Mm. And they. Uh, the full circle compost started a, an, a program with the prison where they they recycle their food waste and turn it into compost and so they they run a whole compost facility out of the prison now yeah so we deter that here um and we use about twenty four thousand pounds of compost a season wow on on farm just, and just that's a free input for you not free not free no no we pay yeah. for it but yeah, that, yeah. You know, that goes back to a real like another local business and yeah and yeah. We, we we invest heavily in that stuff like we seek out local businesses even if it means for us to co or to expend a little bit more cost um to, but to support local families because sure. that like if i give you a dollar you give me back a dollar we we've actually created an infinite value of one dollar yeah and i'm really interested in yeah, that yeah, you yeah. know like yeah, yeah. i love supporting local families and local folks and like and and just creating a barter system or a process like of uh a community like that. I think it's I think it's beautiful. Brad. Yeah. Cool. All that amendment that to be planted into. And that's just a drill. That's yeah, turning it. on a Milwaukee 18 volt drill, turning the bed over. And I mean look at the seed top. It's like yeah, you, you're pretty much ready to plant into this thing. Oh, that looks so nice. Yeah. Look at that soil. Yeah. <laughs> Woo, baby. Just teeming with life. I mean, that's it. You, you no till, like no salinity, no no hard pan up here, no compaction, just just pure life. You know, like pouring through this soil. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent, dude. Amazing. So this this four row cedar. Um, here, actually, let me dump these guys out. I'll show you what this looks like on the inside. The the brush density, or the. Uh, the seed density is determined by these little little seed plates, and so they're they're notched in there. Yeah. And you have four different side seeds. So you've got you've got an A plate, a B, a C, and a D plate. So determined on 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 the seeding density, whether you want multiple seeds per drop or a single seed per drop. I'm doing hawk right turnips right now, and so I have to put them in a single seed per drop. Otherwise, mm. they crowd uh, and they right? bolt. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they bolt. Yeah, if they're they, too close. That's it. Okay. And so, um, yeah, what I what I have to do is when I'm doing these, is is I determine which which seed plate, and then after that, you have to make sure that your brush settings are correct. And and what that means is that 
these little brushes are, are down there and they're actually just pushing up really lightly against that metal knob. Mm. And again, it seems, you know, like compared to the Jang Cedar or even a paper pot, which you, you know, people may transplant uh, turnips I've seen, you really just want that little brush to be touching the top of, um, of the, the, the seeding rod and that way it skims off any extra seeds that are coming in. Mm. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, small little tweaks. Well, that's it. I mean, and these are the things that you learn over a season or two. You make enough mistakes and you're like, ah, oh, I wish my <laughs> brushes were tight. I wish they were on right. Or you, you see it afterwards and you see like your hopper went twice as fast as the other one. And you're like, I forgot to adjust my brushes and you lose it all. So yeah, from here we just, we fill these guys up. You don't need to fill a certain amount just because once you stop, you stop, right? That's exactly it, yeah. yeah. So it's all gonna go through this four row cedar. And I'll show you what it looks like as we pull them in. Sure. And so then, those the wheel turns, the seeds drop right up out of the back side. Yeah. And you know the spacing is already determined by those little seed plates that run in there. Now the seed density. This took us from doing like 150 bunches of turnips on a on a 50 foot bed to running you know close to 300 bunches of turnips on a 50 foot. Holy bed. moly, double. That's it. Um, and you know it just. The intelligence behind this is it feels it feels like it's just you know like as high as it gets or as good as it gets really. So once you're done seeding like you just did, what is the process after that? Um, we just run the year. Well, I'll run a a, a bed a bed leveler on it just to, to put the seeds in because we do have some killdeer and some quail and and birds up here that love radish and and, and small seeds in the bed. So they'll come and munch. Yeah, they'll come and eat them up if I don't do it. And so I just run a bed roller on it. Um, to get the seeds into the soil and uh, and then I turn the irrigation on for about about 15 minutes and just water them in yeah and uh, yeah and then, then I usually water them an extra 15 minutes every uh, every day until mm. um, until I see them germ so usually three or four days and they pop this time of year that easy 50 feet in 94 <laughs> seconds <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> something like that. that easy easy as that yeah yeah all right man where are we now Oh, so this is the first succession of, of high altitude tomatoes. You know, we um we experimented with a lot of varieties uh, over the last couple of years. We've we've definitely sunk our teeth into uh, the inspiration that comes from Connor. He's in the same zone, um, you know, as we did through that stuff for for 11 or 12 years and kind of got his systems in place so that it's right. And uh, and so what we what we're looking at in here is a lot of uh, a lot of tomatoes. We do early slicers. Um, and these are big Danas. That's a, uh, that's a big Dana right there. Yeah, Holy crap. <laughs> and, and we actually, we, um, we take these off twice a week. And so we'll come through and I off of, you know, out of this house, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these tomato plants are going to produce 35 to 40 pounds in a season. Yeah. You'll see that, uh, they've already kind of hit their roof up here, uh, lower and leaned another foot, but they're, 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 they're about 10 foot tall and we'll take them all the way up for another two months mm -hmm. uh, of just pure production. Mm. Um, and so it's, you know, this is, this is you know, you run a cost benefit analysis on building a greenhouse that's kind of airtight, weather tight, um, and it's it's really hard not to, to invest in this level of infrastructure. Okay. Yeah, just, just, just thinking, you know, like if you get five pounds of tomato off every plant and you put 70 in a row, you know, that's it's thirty five hundred dollars a row, mm. um, and one of these houses will cost you about twenty thousand dollars. You know, so you're making it back in season one, right? Totally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a big deal. I mean, when you start to sit down and look at numbers like that, and I think that that's what I see with a lot of other market gardens, and and, and people that are really struggling is that they're they're scared to invest in labor mm. and scared to invest in infrastructure. But if you sit down and pencil it out, man, I mean. Yeah, just looking at it as a business. Yeah, you know, it's it's really, really, it's really easy to, to continue to invest. Heavily so a smaller in farmer might be artificially gating themselves on their growth by just not spending the money. That's it. Yeah, yeah, and, not, and being afraid of the investment. Whereas if you could quantify it, like for you, even just with the paper pot, you're like, oh, <laughs> this pays itself off in two months. You know <laughs> I have I mean? to do it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's dumb not to do it. Yeah, yeah. That's even it. though the price tag, when you look at it, just raw price, you might be, like, ooh, that yeah. hurts a little bit. It hits yeah. you in the solar plexus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just like, oh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, you know, it, it really is. I think that the more I've continued to not withdraw myself philosophically from this, because we are like we're deeply entrenched in it. But like I try not to get so emotional about that stuff. And the yeah. more that I look at it from like a just a stabilized business perspective, I realize, man, that, like there's just a world of potential here. You know, mm. like the, 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 we could feed 
you know, who knows, 800, 800 people off this farm, 1,000 people off this farm, if we can inspire 100 people in our community to do this yeah. over the next 20 years, I mean, that's a significant amount of folks that would be fed in a, in a, in a system that, that, that nobody, you know, was growing food for before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so the way I'm going to hop on, like, come in front because I think it's important. It's like the way I, I kind of see it is like, we want to see, I want to see at least, thousands of yous. Yeah. Right? Um, because then you can do all this localized sustainable stuff that you can't do at scale conventionally, right? Because your transport costs, like just the raw dumping of nitrogen on the soil, like all that stuff. Yeah. So I, I would like to see in the future kind of like a high tech natural, like very systemized, very scaled, yeah. right? Everything's very efficient, but it's also not that big and you're not trying to maximize profit like crazy. Obviously, you got to make profit. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, and then and then there's a bunch of people like, like Zach or Steven, you guys have seen a bunch of the other people that have been on the channel doing this as just a respectable viable career almost like returning to the ancient time it feels like it you know yeah yeah but yeah. just just with the tools of today that's it yeah yeah, yeah. and I, I do I, I agree with you 100 percent I mean I see like I see the interest and I think that people are just really seeking like there's a there's a hunger for 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 methodologies yeah. you know yeah and and yeah, I couldn't recommend following, you know, Connor Crickmore and just looking on Instagram or getting signing up for one of those online courses mm. and, and you know investing the time in that enough. Because I think that that level of infrastructure and that level of confidence as you approach something like this allows you to really just go all into it. Yeah. And I, I if we had like I just think about, you know, the, the viability of our food systems. If we had localized food systems like that, we, we you know, like the, then you develop like tradition around food again and mm -hmm. seasonality and like you really, get culture. Really cool back things. in your community yeah. back which is like what we don't have in our suburban life That's right it. Yeah. yeah yeah we don't know our neighbors you know yeah. like and there's 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 a lot of fear and stuff that that our bodies are just filled with you know mm. and anxiety and, mm. and, and you eat this food you know it, it has some intrinsic benefits that help out in that way some medicinal stuff sure too, you sure, know? sure and, yeah and, and yeah and, and then you get to be a part of a community that makes you feel whole and complete and things that you actually yearn to be so. for sure so we use these trellis clips which which um they come from johnny's uh the way that we just weave it as the plant grows weekly we come through um, we weave it around these strings you'll see that it's all tied to a really simple plastic clip down here at the bottom which essentially becomes obsolete just because you've woven it around the plant so many times mm. um, when it hits to the when it gets to the top of its string what we do is we take that plastic clip we pinch it right on the side and then it actually drops down and dispenses about, I don't know what the circumference of that is, but it's probably about six inches of string. Mm -hmm. So then we just drop it six inches at a time on a weekly basis and continue to weave it. And, yep. and, and, and that allows us to grow 35 or 40 foot tall tomato plants. Yeah, because eventually, so you've got this one here, which hasn't been leaned too many times yet. Uh -huh. Then you've got those over there, which have been leaned quite a few times. Yeah, that's and it. And they just start to wrap, right? That's it. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So you can, I mean, that's how you grow those tomatoes they drop into the ground in March 5th on March 15th for us mm -hmm. um, we begin to harvest cherries late April early May and they go till August right that's it yeah 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 and the only way we can make that happen is by you know you're gonna get a 40 foot tall plant um, you have to be able to find a system that allows that yeah. to happen and yeah there, there's there's a lot um, I think that's taken from big ag mm. and put into small ag like that makes us sustainable or successful. So lower and lean was a big ag technique. Totally. Yeah. 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 Because I mean, uh, and you're also just looking at like pruning suckers and and all of that. So this is one single line. So one you train everything plant. to a single leader. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And you have to, otherwise, it just goes like this, and it takes up so much space. Mm. So on a 30-inch bed top, you can't have multiple leaders. I, I've seen folks get away with two, mm -hmm. but even that is chaos for me. So I prefer to keep a you know a single liter uh, grow at 20 feet or 25 feet on a, on a slicer and and still get 35 or 40 pounds of fruit off of the plant per plant times what 70 per row that's it and then the math starts to really get crazy right yeah yeah, yeah yeah totally and if you're on early you know you could you could really hit your hit your market and and it, like i said it, it can give you a stronghold yeah and in a market that so if you're wondering like well how can i get into my markets mm. and, and and what can i offer go to the markets and shop them and that was a technique that I also learned from Connor and, and then, you know, saying like, hey, I can offer you this, you know, I could bring in tomatoes in, 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 in May or June. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's your second year, you know, don't throw that out there on your first season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, you can, you can do that. And, okay. Yeah, and then it'll give you a stronghold. It'll give you a good month of, uh, of just exclusively being the grower. Because you kind of have to have some kind of, not a trick, but some sort of in, some differentiator so that they give you a chance. Yeah, market right? managers are looking for that too. Yeah, you know, yeah. we actually manage a market. We started a farmer's market because we grow for seasons up here mm. and so um, 
yeah, we, we, we realize that as a market manager, if somebody comes to you and they've got the zeal to say like, hey, I noticed you guys are missing this, I would love to offer you this, that's the type of grower that a market manager wants. Because yeah. they're like, you see this, They're you know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like searching for an employee almost, you know? Sure. Yeah, there's somebody you're investing in. Mm -hmm. Sweet, so we're still in the same greenhouse, but we got, what's at our feet here? We got some bok choy. Yeah, that's right, some beets. Got some beets. That's and it. so this is another instance of just making the most of your space, yeah? Yeah, yeah, totally. And so we, I mean, you think about it on that scale of 50 feet, uh, on a 30 inch bed top and then you just what we tend to do is we'll plant the beets two weeks or a week before we plant our bok choy um, you can plant that simultaneously uh, so if I have some extra bok choy in the prop house mm. um, I, I'll just run through a half tray or a full tray and put it into the outside of the skirt of my beds and the same thing with things that like like little gem lettuce oh also yeah 30 days yeah you know? beautiful variety yeah and they aren't gonna get shaded out by these cucumbers or or by the tomatoes they rush mm. and so with that that continues to allow us to be diverse and maximize space but you just you, if you're thinking about it in terms of square footage and that's how I tend to look at the farm I want every foot on the farm of the bed to uh, every row foot to make thirty dollars okay and so if I'm thinking about it like that every you know then I realize like oh cool if, if I've got five hundred dollars in bok choy on the perimeter of the beds um, with the, these cucumbers um, not just in the single planting but over the season like is it going to achieve those ends sure. and so I'm always using that as a cross-reference and saying Okay, is this is this a viable way for us to do it? Is this you know coming to meet those ends? Yeah. And yeah. Then, and then things like this are just so simple and like seeds, especially for things like bok choy. Cheap. Cheap. Yeah. Overseed them. Yeah. You know, like, Not Salanova. <laughs> no, no, that's yeah. it. You have overseed them. So for us, like in the prop house, I'll I'll put a hundred feet of seed in every week. Mm. And that doesn't mean I'm going to use it, mm. but it does mean that, yeah, like I may toss some trays at the end of the month, yeah. but, but so be it. Like I, I would prefer to have that and extra so that every time I plant cucumbers, I could throw extra bok choy in yeah. or some extra gem lettuce in um, and, 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 you know, just make it, make it happen. So, and even, I mean, even on these tomatoes, like if you're worried about shading out, you're pruning everything off the bottom anyways. That's it. And this is effect. I mean, besides, I guess a little shade thrown by the canopy right here. Yeah. These are getting relatively full sun they throughout will. the day. Yeah. And so we put these in, we put these in a week before this year and next year I'll do two weeks. Yeah. Cause you'll notice a lot of them plumped up to almost maturity yeah. and then, and then they haven't finished sizing up. And so we just ride it out with them. Um, you know, we pull about 10 bunches off of the bed a week right now and that's about it. But that's still, I mean, it's, it, we're just maximizing square footage. That space wouldn't have gone anywhere else. All right, sweet. We're in the wash and pack zone and we're looking at some charts. Yeah. yeah. So, um, on a daily basis, the farm kind of revolves around these. What, uh, what you see is this is a, a topographical map of the entire farm with all of the bed numbers listed on it. Yeah. Um, and what we do is, is then we'll say like, you're on, you're on, here's a good example, wash and pack uh, from nine to 11. Um, and then did you complete that? Yes. Uh, yep. Then dino kale F4, F5, 11 to uh, 130. Yes, completed. And then turn over these beds. Uh, you want to, etc. And so the whole farm essentially revolves around this and it's a standard. Yep. And so it, it, it works for me keeping everybody accountable saying like, hey, I know that it can be done in this amount of time. Mm. Um, and and so we start to execute things like this and, and we hold each other accountable with that knowing that if even like all the positions are interchangeable every yeah, day, yeah. that every person holds that position down and the same. And you're getting better all the time, right? Because you guys are just having like a packing speed competition yeah. over here. <laughs> that's, that's totally it. Yeah, so we, you know, we, we kind of push that bar and say like, is it possible to, to bag, you know, 30 seconds a bag for, for, for retail greens? Yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're just, just, you know, seeing those processes on, on everything that we do. Let me, uh, let me show you a little bit over here. We do, uh, we've got some green spinners, um, which are, which are pretty, pretty radical tools. These guys, they, I know a lot of folks out there are using modified spinners. The laundry um, machines, that's yeah. That's it, and, but they spin too fast. Um, and that's something else that comes from Connor Crickmore, but we uh, we found these guys on eBay. They shipped up from San Diego. Um, mm. Ah, no way, yeah, my yeah, hometown. Yeah, yeah a, couple, a couple hundred bucks, and um, it made it, made, it makes, it makes washing the greens and drying them totally possible. So we um, we get them into retail bags the day after. We store them in some some totes, uh, some hard plastic totes with a, with a towel, an organic towel in there that absorbs or wicks the moisture, and then we bag them the next day. But this allows the greens to not perish. We get a lot of feedback that we hold greens 
for three weeks. Okay. Yeah, um, which is pretty pretty phenomenal for fresh salad greens, especially from a small market farm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, talk to me about you were saying the cold chain, right? Which I think a lot of people might not really know what that is. Yeah, yeah. So we we get things from the field. He's in bok choy right now. And so what that looks like is he's out there, he's budding, cleaning them up, harvesting them, um, and then we dump them into 45 degree water. So it may be 90 degrees in the field right now, 85 yeah, degrees in like the that. field. And you know, so your your plant temperature is, is is probably around 65 or 70. And how in the world do you stop it from producing ethylene gas or ethanol gas, uh, ethylene gas, while while it's in post harvest and cold washing like this? is a secret for us. Mm. We get it right off of the field. We don't let it get full even in the totes. If it's hot outside, we just bring them right back. We dunk them into 43 or 45 degree water. Um, they either go, then they go through this. If they need to be spun, they're spun. But then we have a, a big 140 square foot walk-in refrigerator. We just walk everything right to um, and, and And we push it from there. So from the moment it's harvested, it stops. Mm. Um, it stops that gas production. And then we hold it there. And then I built out a small reefer trailer in the back of a sprinter van yeah. um, that, that holds it while we do deliveries or we run around the city. Or when we're at a farmer's market, we just plug in a generator mm. and, and we can hold it there for four or five hours at 40 degrees. So when people are coming up, they grab a it's bag chill. at noon yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. 40 degrees. They're yeah, like, yeah. How? Yeah. how have you done this? So from the time you harvest to the time it leaves the customer's hands, it only starts to warm back up at that point once they purchase. 100%. But in between then, it's 40 to 43 degrees the whole time. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Veritable Vegetable is the largest uh, regional vegetable distributor. And I used to work as a produce manager for a food mm. co-op for four years. Mm. And so that level of information and seeing things like that happen and, and, and just seeing what that meant to Veritable as far as keeping the cold chain. Yeah. That was a huge inspiration for me. Mm. Saying like. All right, on that scale where you guys are dispersing all the way out to New Mexico, you know, or distributing out there, uh, why is it so important that that you know when you when you cross the bridge from the warehouse into the back of the truck, why is that refrigerated? Uh huh. And it's why. So mm. I think as small scale farmers, you know, for us to continue to be successful, this this is 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 vital to our success. Is keeping things just ice cold or as cold as you can yeah. through your wash and pack process. Yeah, because then you got a customer coming back to you because they know it's not going to go bad after four days in the fridge, right? We've developed a reputation. Yeah. You know, like it's our second year through it. Um, we have we you know we, we our markets are big. You yeah. know, and we, we've really established a foothold in our markets because people are like. You guys have the best greens. Yeah, there you they're, go. They're the freshest stuff out there. So everything, everything walks through here pretty much, and then it uh, it heads, it heads into to this, um, which we intentionally built right outside of the wash and pack. Just to be fast. Just to be fast. This is a Friday load for an acre and a half farm. Oh, it's cold in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice and ice cold. Um, so now you get to see. Yeah, what a, what the wash and pack looks like before before we get out for delivery. We've already packed probably about fifty percent, um, but you will get to see like when you come in here in the next month. I mean, it's packed to the ceiling. The whole side that we're standing on right now also gets packed full, and then it's just waiting to go to market or waiting to go to CSA. Yeah, <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> we so, got a delivery. <laughs> yeah. So then it'll come through here. So it's freezer number two, cooler number two. Yeah, so this is this is the mobile version of that. I love this, dude. Yeah, and I mean, it's obviously custom built or home built, but then this is like, we do 80 people or 80 person CSA off of the farm, um, and you get to see like, yeah, the, 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 pretty much our entire CSA and these half totes fits into here, plus our entire market. And it's, it's, you know, it's about nine square feet or nine, nine, nine by yeah, nine. Yeah, this is a, this is like a dorm room, if that, it's yeah. small. Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. But it, you know, it, it works. For us, it, on our scale, I built it to that size. It, you know, I used recycled, uh, um, recycled insulation. Uh, I had some old tape, uh, the metal taping left over from the greenhouse. Um, I, I paid 300 bucks for a brand new AC unit with a cool bot. I think I'm probably in about six or seven hundred dollars for this. Wow! And it took me two days. Wow! You know what I mean? And so. I, and you I, said you're bringing, you've got names for your your CSA customers right here. Yeah, yeah which totally. Which is amazing. And so you can come out, drive out from here into Reno or whatever, and set your market up and deliver out your CSA one fell swoop. That's it. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. And so just efficiency, you know, like and, and quality, all all in the same, this you know, the same time. It, it really makes all the difference in the world for us. All right, guys, that was it. I mean, I'm sure we could go in depth on. Let me do a video on every single part we just did many times over, but big thanks to Zach for showing the farm and I kind of wanted to get a little history on 
the farm. It, you haven't been doing this that long, no, right? No, no. Um, and maybe maybe I should tell you guys what the like Prema stands for. So Prema for us means it means like unconditional love essentially. And in Sanskrit, there's two types of love. One's kama, and that means like I love you, but only if you act like this. Mm. And prema means like I I it's it's big you know big love like I love you no matter what you do and mm. you know that that's uh that that's kind of our attitude towards farming it means like we give everything every moment of every day to the farm and whatever it brings back to us it, it, it gives to us and so that attitude I think is surrounded it's been pervasive out here and it's allowed us to continue to to work with the land and not against it mm. um, the first year we came out you know I I was I was not in that mind state I was not in that space you know I I was fighting you know I was I was trying everything I could to make all of this happen in a way that I had seen other folks do it, you yeah. know, like Jean-Martin Fortier and, and, but I, I just didn't have all of the right intimate tools. And, and, you know, year two, we silage tarped out everything outdoors. We left it under tarp, um, for, for about eight months and pulled the tarps back and really, really got things started. It allowed us kind of to be weed free, mm -hmm. um, allowed us to start to get into irrigation systems. I, I think that I'm still in it in, in a way that I know that I want this to be an incubator farm. I want this to be an outsource for, for information for the community that I'm in. Yep. And, and we're still developing a lot of the stuff on the farm. I mean, without Connor's help, without John Martin Fortier's help, and without like a lot of the other folks that we get to follow along, I, I wouldn't have the information I do at hand, but um, it's, it, it, it's possible, you guys. Like if I could do it up here at 5260, I, I, anybody in other lower altitudes yeah. could make it happen. I mean. And, and you're not, it's not like you're just doing it at 5260, you're doing it pretty successfully yeah. on a small scale. Because I know a lot of small scale farmers that are struggling to make ends meet or to just, just the, it's almost a conceptual thing of how they're thinking about the farm. Mm -hmm. Like you're talking about, okay, if you're out there for eight hours, pay yourself 25 bucks an hour and realize, oh, I spent eight hours on the wrong stuff. That's it. Because I just had to pay myself 200 bucks. That's, I'm not making the 200 <laughs> back. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, everything we've built out here has been, has, has I, I run cost benefit analysis pretty much in my mind on every decision I make yeah. and say like, cool, like this level of infrastructure would be really beautiful. And I saw some other folks have the nicest, cleanest wash and pack ever. Yeah. But like I, what I'm doing and what I have works really well, and this is definitely a higher priority. So let me put my attention where it needs to be and build the things that are going to allow this to self-sustain and prioritize that stuff first. I, I think that you know, like when you're in the mix of the middle of a season and things are chaotic, it's really hard to make rational decisions sometimes. So like <laughs> putting things on paper yeah. and and running it like a business is really helpful. I feel like running a business, and I've never run a farm, but I've run like a small microgreens operation, yeah. and certainly running Epic Gardening. It feels like running a business is just select actively ignoring stuff all the time because you like you walk around and you see the stuff that you need to fix in a perfect world yeah. then you're like no like the 80 20 analysis of it is this is what has to, uh, it has to take up like 100 percent of my time right now that's it yeah yeah and just knowing where it's worthwhile yeah. yeah yeah cool well like so where can people find you i know you guys have instagram you've got some you've got a website if you're in the reno area you can join the csa you can hit them at market so Drop some knowledge, tell people where to find you out. Super, yeah. www.premafarm.com uh, is the website. Um, you can find us on Instagram at Prema Farm, um, Facebook Prema Farm. Um, we do little weekly newsletters and just kind of like blurbs from the farm, let everybody know what's up. If, uh, if you're in the Reno area, like, yeah, come get us at markets. We, we're in Thursday night markets over at McKinley. We do a Saturday market at California Street and then up in Truckee. If you're visiting the Reno Tahoe area, you can get us in Truckee on Sundays. Sweet. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, dude. Heck yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> so yeah. good. All right, guys. Peace out. Good Peace. luck in the garden. Keep growing. I'm dropping everything in the description. And if you have any questions for Zach, drop them in the comments and, and we'll pop in and, and see what we can do to answer those. But until next time, good luck in the garden. Keep on growing. And check out this Salanova, dude. <laughs>